Avenue. Um, we're back again, and we took a short uh, break since this has been a marathon uh, sculpting session. But we um, basically finished up in this area here, got the details um, sculpted in there. We're going to be working on the uh, digits of the foot now. Um, basically, they've all been blocked in as far as how they need to appear. So, for those of you that are just joining this event, this is the uh, detail sculpting for the creature feet. We've already got one done, and uh, that one's been detailed out. This is the second one that we brought with uh, part one from blocking to uh, detailing the side here. Uh, part two is detailing this side, and part three, and hopefully the final part, will be um, the top and then the final detail. So, we're going to be working the digits. So this is always fun because we have some uh, details that we have to emulate from the first foot over to the second one. So we're building up around the cuticles and this will make it to where those those toenails are not quite so long looking. over to this other cam. You can see how I'm just basically adding those same details. I'm going to use this one as reference, but we're adding those same details over to this side. Okay. So this is just a matter of putting on those areas and blending them up. Again, there aren't many images that you can find online of the feet. There are images that say that they are the um, universal molds, casts, cast from the universal molds. Um, I've seen some differences and I don't know if it's just the age of the molds or you know what was going on but I, I read the description on the length and there's no way that the length is right so more likely than not it was, is we are uh, actually sculpting this 12 percent larger than it will need to be in its final form and that will give us the uh, true size because otherwise you know if we don't have it the proper um, proper length and size to start, by the time we go and cast it in latex, it's going to shrink so much that it's just not going to be accurate anymore. And this, since this is going to be a wearable costume, <coughs> we want it to be as, as accurate as we can get it. So some of these bony ridges and depressions we're going to leave, others we're going to fill in because it does add to the to the overall aesthetic of the piece, you know, because he had these gnarly feet, not necessarily the best condition, walking around in muck beds and that sort of thing. So, this is where we start adding in all the final details. I'm not sure how much of this you can see. I'm going to try to make it to where you can see the most that we can. And again, feel free to join in, dip out, you know, whatever you have to do. Um, because we realize this is a long process. Believe me, a, a marathon day like today is going to leave my hands pretty well shot. But 
it needs to get done and we're pushing deadline on this so we want to be sure to to get it done that's why you know spend all week working on other studio paid gigs and deadlines and then you know hopefully we work ahead to where we have enough time to work on stuff like this but we're getting to go time where we need to move on to things like the hands and the bodysuit which are going to take a lot of time so we want to be sure to have enough time left over to give this justice because the suit is going to be a major undertaking we have to do a, a body life cast albeit a, a, an economy version because this is a charity event we don't have a lot of money for waste so we have to go back to our down and dirty roots but we're basically smoothing out all of these details here making sure we have no undercuts or areas that are not 100% cleaned up time this is getting molded that's not when you want to find out oh I missed a spot and we also get to move over uh, very very shortly but we'll be moving over to the uh, fine line tools that we need for that final detailing especially the wrinkles and the creases in the the fin parts here so again if you're jo joining us on our YouTube feed this will be available after the fact obviously so you can always catch up and scrub through but the important thing is that you subscribe subscribe if you like what you're seeing because we're going to be doing a lot more uh, videos um, different processes that we can show you because there's a lot of work that we just can't because of NDAs non-disclosure agreements but we have a fair number of jobs just like this that you can take part in and see and see exactly how we do this because this is one thing that that shows in everything that I go to they say oh I wish we could you know see what happens behind the scenes in the shop or like on face off when when you see a lot of that they move so quickly through the behind the scenes and the creation and the sculpting of a piece and move right on to you know judging and you get to see the whole process with this so it's kind of cool if you're into the behind the scenes stuff <coughs> But this is where we got to be really efficient with our time. And we're hoping that we can um, get this all done with this final feed. And then eventually, within the next week or so, move into the molding phase. But right now we're worried about just getting the details around the toes and cuticles right. One of the pleasures of living in Florida and having a steel building as your shop. But you'll get the idea as well, um, you know, how quickly this stuff works. And if you're just joining in in this part, a um, couple of things is that this is uh, Monster Clay. Uh, available for monster makers in your local distributor I find that it's it's the most um, appropriate sculpting medium for something like this you could use um, Chavant NSP plastiline Roma plastiline as long as it's a sulfur free because a lot of times at least in our shop we try to stay away from sulfurous products um, because we do a fair amount of silicone as well 
and sulfur doesn't like silicone. It doesn't get along well with it at all. Silicone's pretty finicky, so we try to keep those things down. Even working with latex, we have to be really careful um, casting with latex, and then we kind of have to keep everything segregated so it doesn't get um, inhibited by the by the latex when we use silicone. Because it can literally um, inhibit just from having latex residue in the area. It's a really big deal when you're working with this stuff um, to pay very close attention to any cross-contamination and that includes in the atmosphere, in the air around you. People have blown hundreds of dollars worth of silicone because of mishandling and having silicone in the same area that you're working on latex or you get latex on your hands and then you start working on silicone and it's a big mess so learn from others mistakes and these techniques that I'm using here uh, I've been using mostly the tools that you see here on the on the turntable um, very basic tools that you can get through Kemper um, I think on this round the most sophisticated I have is is the um, you know cutting edge sculpture and I have a handful of Ken's tools but for the most part we're just using the tools you see here up until the time we get to um, fine line detailing and that sort of thing but I will show you as we make that break as well but it's all detailing at this point doing is grading down around the cuticle of the foot. We'll continue because you see that there is the upper part, that's where the fin is, and then this is pretty thick. So what we actually do is thin that down from the bottom, and by the time we actually start sculpting in detail in the reverse side, after we mold the top, um, that's where we'll clean that up so it looks like it's supposed to. But right now we have to use what we have and kind of just build that cuticle out. We're also going to build little sprues or vents under the toenails so when we make our mold we don't have hollows under the toenail and then that just gets cleaned up in um, with scissors when we're cleaning up and, and detailing the mask after or the, the shoes in this case, the boots to the costume after it comes out of the mold, which every latex mask, unless you're able to, by some miracle, do a one-piece mold, you're always going to have cleanup. But um, we tried a new technique that uh, worked very well with um, cleaning up the mask portion of this. It actually used a chemical called Bestine, which is a brand name, but it's used um, primarily to thin rubber cement. Well, the side effect is, is that it thins out latex, cured latex, just as nicely. So when you have the latex and you start cleaning up your edges and your lines and trimming them back, it works as not only a lubricant against the, uh, the latex, but a solvent that softens the latex. So you get this beautiful edge as you're cleaning and detailing your, your piece, your seam. Makes it a pleasure. Because that's always the, the big nightmare is you've cast your mold, you've, you've done your piece, you've cast it in latex, and then you have to do the trim up in the seaming. And if you don't do it right, nothing you did up until that point is going to matter. So we're continuing to work around the toes. And like you can 
can see on the other one that we're working from it has a termination line so we're building that into this one as well get all the other angles from the from the top once we get that done so again like subscribe share if you like what you're seeing we are going to be adding more videos for those of you that are joining us for our third time today we thank you had these jagged scales almost around the uh, the cuticle of the nail so that's what we're working on now one thing I really love about this monster clay is that it, it really responds well um, and smooth be smooths beautifully it has a very um, waxy consistency so it sticks pretty well to itself <clears throat> but I found that for this type of thing doing life-size butts and and feet like this it you know, if you're doing a whole suit it gets expensive it's not the cheapest stuff but you usually buy it once and that's all you need we've been you know once we mold a piece we are able to um, clean the clay melt it down and strain it and actually get you know several uses out of that same clay so it is pretty reusable I like the way it it cleans up too because just by screening it through a regular um, you know home screen has to be a metal screen but if you are able to clean it that way it comes out perfect you never noticed that it was used before and we've lost maybe three to ten percent just from stuff that just is too dirty to reuse I don't like reusing it once it gets too dirty especially if it's molded in a certain material that might inhibit other materials we use see how quickly this stuff works. Arnold Goldman coming up with this and the monster foam. I gotta rave about the monster foam as well. If you guys do prosthetics it was what was considered the old McLaughlin, McLaughlin foam and it's been refined a little bit and, and evolved but that's mostly what we use because it's probably the easiest foam with the easiest directions and this being Florida we have all sorts of issues with uh, humidity, temperature, barometric pressure, all those things. And for Florida, um, it seems to work really well in our environment. I've worked with others that were not quite so friendly to work with, require a little more patience and skill and experimentation. you guys are enjoying this series lots more coming soon because we still got to do hands and the bodysuit and everything else so the what mass yeah the mass painting that's going to be a fun one too because everyone has their idea as to what color he should be and there's like the original um, press stuff that came out around the time that the movie did in 1954 but most of that was just colored um, stills from the from the movie there was only one real resource for color and that was that it appeared in the life 
magazine um, because the person that handled the photography of that also worked on the set of Creature from the Black Lagoon. So pictures were taken that were supposedly of what the suit looked like in color. And if you Google Life Magazine Creature Shoot, they usually come up pretty easy, but they're beautiful, beautiful coloring. But there has even been arguments as to what the uh, actual colors were, if that was accurate, because in her own memoirs, and, and if you talk to her, it shows Julie, um, Julie Adams, the female in that, she played Kay, she didn't remember that he had those garish red lips. But in the Life magazine article, in the shoot that they did, he definitely had red lips. So, I don't know if she just didn't remember it, or if maybe they had changed the coloration of the creature. Nobody's been able to ever really um, shed any insight on it. And I've even asked Rico Browning at one point what color the lips were. And he said he thought that they were red, but then Julie Adams said that they weren't next to him. And he kind of said, well, I don't really remember, so I don't know who would have any kind of insight. I would think someone like Bob Burns, but I don't think he even had an original suit. These things, shoot, if you think about it, they were foam back in the day when this was made. They were foam. Foam rubber. Which, even if you're not in the water, it's hard to keep that you know, around a while, because foam breaks down so quickly. It's an organic, and it's latex-based, so it really has some issues. But, um, not, not much left of that suit, I'm sure, by the time it was done filming. I'm just using the side of this tool to plane this down a little bit. Give us a more realistic flow. Blend those edges. A lot of this uh, lumpy bumpiness that you're seeing, we're going to use that to our advantage in the next step. So when we start smoothing this down, you're going to see why I'm leaving a lot of that because it really adds to the real life feel of this is a creature suit. We want him to look true to the movie, but we do, since it's going to be live and not in, you know, a black and white movie, low resolution, we do have to give it all of the, uh, the bells and whistles so it looks good in real life, too. And people are going to be doing photo ops with this, so we want it to be accurate, but we also want it to be maybe a little bit better give a true homage to Millicent Patrick and Chris Mueller. We're just gouging out a little bit around the front because this is the only toe on it, if I remember correctly from the photographs, that had a little bit of a divot around it like that. So I want to maintain that. In the end, you probably won't even be paying attention to the feet. But, I want the details to be there. And this adding to that whole feeling of crustacean, it has this interesting pattern to the bones that there's not only the top of the toe bone, but then there's the subform here, and down here we got to add some of that um, almost like a lobster tail look, so we're going to be adding that back in. But first things first. And if you guys have any questions, even after the fact, please leave them in the comments. It's turned on to where you guys can actually leave comments, ask questions, whatever.
Well, in this one, I just used the broad tool. Actually, this one. I used this wire tool. It's the Kemper D7. Um, when I went over to this one, I actually used a combination, and I'll show you. But on the finishing, I actually used another Kemper tool. This is a knife tool. And then I actually go back and I chamfer those edges so it's not just a line. It's actually uh, almost like a tent if you're looking at it from the side. And I use the um, cutting edge sculpture tool. It's almost so fine you can't even see. But I love this tool for that fine detail. But this is just placeholder. But wait, because when we get that added in there, it's really going to pop. Like you said, it, it just sets it off. And if you remember the gill work um, on the mask, that was done similarly. So we used basically that fine line tool, but we actually knocked it up uh, quite a bit because instead of doing it as a, you know, a direct look of what it was for the, um, the promotional art, we went in and decided, okay, we're going to make this even better. And that's when we decided to put almost like a basses gills because people are going to be looking this a lot more and a lot closer up so that's one place that we took liberties is we actually gave him detail to the back of his gills so when you're looking at him from the back he actually has gills under his exterior gills but I consider art almost like if you're a mechanic having the right tools makes all the difference in the world so I do have more tools than I regularly use and a lot of times I'll be working on a particular project and I'll even say to myself, oh my god, I really need something to make this easier. This is taking too long. And then I'll run to the metal fab box and pull out some piano wire or you know something like that and make a tool that works. You know, obviously if you have general purpose tools like the Kempers, they work fantastic. And most of the time, you know, if you're working on something with the Kemper tools, you know, it's broad strokes. But when you get into more um, specific uses, then you might have to buy other tools. One that I use religiously when I'm doing head sculpts, it's actually by Ken's Tools. Um, if you look it up, but it's this itty bitty set. And he calls itty bitty this thing is tiny it's the 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 wire it's similar to a regular wire tool but it's actually the the diameter or the gauge of the wire is less than a staple so it's almost like you're sculpting with a fine 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 wire rather than um, even like with this one this one I use for broader broader removal but that's about the size of a staple give or take and the one that I use for the mini action figure heads where the head is, is a total of about one inch, you know, one inch tall from the jaw to the top of the head. That one I, I go to the specific tools, the itty bitties from Ken's tools. So they're good. But you can see how those are shaping up, very organic forms. on those edges and all the details it's kind of pulling from the edge I don't know if you can see this but rather than pushing it I'm going into that groove a little bit and pulling the clay out because I really want a nice line of demarcation there at the end of that toe joint or whatever this is. I guess we can call it a toe joint. Okay, so we have the basics of the foot bones in there. I do want to get some more lay layout of the, the Consider the subforms over here because the way that his toe kind of overlaps, and this is where the beginning of the the beginning of the webbing is going to take place on that. And 
unfortunately a lot of this that we have in there we're going to have to kind of uh, redo, flatten out before we then put in our permanent fish fin lines. But that would be next. We're getting there. on this is probably going to be significantly easier than it was on the mask if you were a part of that because it may still be I'm counting on two parts but I'm holding in the back of my head that we might have to do three just because of the configuration and we want to have an easy removal so we're either going to make the decision here soon to either do a left and right half and then a bottom or just do it as um, one piece for the top and then we can hot box the clay and the clay re gets really soft just with like put it this way you could put it in your car and it would um, soften up so I'm just going to take these lines down a little bit because this we're going to have to rework that was just placeholder so I could get a feel for everything. But, you know, delicate touch. Just be very, very delicate when you're working with it. And then we're going to kind of just use our finger. If there are some stubborn areas, I might go in with the wooden tool. But for the most part, we're just going to work our finger and smooth out those lines. If we have to add any more material, we can do that as well. Now for the edges that are closest to the, the sculpt, I will have to use the tool. My fingers can only do so much. Okay, see how that's all smoothing out now. And we're going to clean this up just a little bit as well. Because the creature suit had these fine little wrinkles around here. So we're just going to clean that up to where we can get in there. And get those uh, wrinkles. And most likely, I don't know that it was sculpted in there. It may have actually been from the foam or the latex kind of wrinkling under his feet. But if it was sculpted in there, that was detail that you didn't usually see as a, as a general rule of the day. You just didn't see that kind of detail in the creature suits from the 50s, with the exception of something like Metal Luna Mutant, which was another beautiful universal alien. You just didn't see that kind of detail, typically. Testament to the artists that, that worked that. And I believe that was also, as we talked about before, I think that was one of Millicent Patrick's as well, the Metal Luna Mutant. But then you had some that were nostalgic at best, but like the, uh, the Mole Men, or the Mole People, they were some wacky designs. Or the Alligator People. interesting clunky designs but that was much more typical of the day they had gone through a shift of you know the typical universal monster wolfman frankenstein dracula and everyone was getting into the space age and science fictions and that sort of thing so they were experimenting with aliens and um mutants and stuff like that
But this, this suit always and still does just stands out. Of all of the universal monsters that weren't included in the original, what they would consider the real art gang. Frankenstein, Mummy, Dracula, Wolfman. Um, this, this creature just stood out, man. So we're continuing to smooth out those where my fingers can't get. And we're just leveling this out. You can see the details between that. Just leveling out the fins. Again, you might ask, why why even bother leveling or putting detail in if you're going to take it out anyway? But it helps with spacing, because if I'm looking at the original and I'm figuring how apart, how far apart those those veins are or whatever in the, the, the fins, by adding the spacing, then I can say, okay, for sure this is wide enough go by known constants to get as close as you can on the rest, because that's all you got sometimes. Okay, so we have all of the deep gouges that we put in that cleaned up quite a bit. This is where I'm going to use the Kemper knife. And I know they're a little more than a, maybe a millimeter and a half, two millimeters, but I'm going to start at the center, not applying a lot of pressure, but I'm pulling that straight down. Move over about a millimeter and a half to two millimeters. Slight flaying as you go down. And we're just doing in more precise finning. If they're not perfect, that's fine. But we want close to symmetrical on those. And then we're going to do the same thing. And yes, it takes a pretty steady hand because you can't fit a ruler in here. And we're just adding those lines in. Okay. It's pretty close to the other one. So then I'm going to go back to the cutting edge sculpture tool. Probably going to try the round one, but I think last time I used the the, uh, the wedge shape. But we're going to start and go down at about a 45 degree angle in that groove that we just put. And then we're going to flip the tool and we're going to come down the other at that same 45 degree angle clean up that line for every one of those grooves we basically have to do the same thing as we travel down we're cleaning up that edge and giving it a nice chamfered or chiseled look and you gotta go back and forth go back and forth Do one, see how it looks, go back to the next, and so on and so forth. And we're still going to be left with a chiseled edge, but I will show you, like by the next step, once we're done with this and we start doing our final pass on detail, you're going to see how why that's not really a big deal, because we're going to knock that down manually. And that way it's going to have a very... Um, organic look. Just 
bouncing back and forth between one side of the channel and the other. No one's saying that this couldn't be, uh, you know, battle damage or you got bit by an alligator or something like that. So it doesn't have to be perfect, perfect, but the perfectionist in me at least tries for it. Just skip out of the groove, just we'll fix it. that looks and it leaves a bunch of little curly corkscrew things all over your desk what we're doing is we're taking a chip brush and chip brushes are about two inches long but this one as you can see it's it's cut in about half but this one picked up a little dirt somewhere so we're getting a new one and then the other trick is the air duster my home air duster but there are a number of them dust off or whatever and but dust. end dust not the spray that cleans the furniture but just the the end dust spray but all of this is very tacky when it gets soft so if we want to clean that up we turn the care can over and invert it and then it shoots out the propellant which is cold and then I can knock that dust and debris and little bits out which is exactly what we're going to do. We don't want them hanging around. Because when we get to our detailing with the dog brush, which yes I know that's another new tool, but when we get to the dog brush You'll see why you want as clean a start as possible. But you can see how nice and uniform those are. So we're going to do the same with the fin two and three. We'll start with our line of symmetry. slam inside and outside left and right I went off of that center line a little bit but that's okay I'll just pick it up Also going to bring out a lot of these details is in the painting process. I don't know how well. 
well you can see that we have those lines cut in I'm going to smooth it out a little bit because I did skip over a couple of those lines so I'm going to re almost like the equivalent of using an eraser and we'll go back in with the brush or the, the wire tool and again a little quick left right 45 on each line and then we clean some of those crumbs out. Still going to get down in there with the dog brush, but that gives us a nice starting point to our lines. And to our final side, dividing line right down the center. Just skipping over. Just coming over about a millimeter down to about two millimeters tops. That'll give it a nice accordion fin look to it. wider so I'm going to bisect that. Let's come back in and add a line down the center. Got a brush bristle in it. Sometimes that happens. Again, I'm just going to bisect that. Okay. This time I'm going to try the flat edge, see if we skip a little bit less. I think that's what was happening last time where I was getting so much slippage. And that's our 45. is working a little better. I think I'm getting two two sides at once as well, making it a little bit easier to clean out those edges. Weather interruptions on the live feed yet? Yay! There, monster kids. Edges a little bit more. I 
kind of like this tool a little bit better too. Okay, so we've got our finning done mostly on that side. I'm going to jump back to this area in here. So I want to uh, further refine this uh, dew claw. Um, in just a little bit. And I'm going to do that with the same tool, just following the lines that are already there. I'm just going to add some other lines of, um, you know, just distinction that they can look a little bit more like what this does and what that one does so okay so we have all of our lines in we have one other section that has a little different pattern but still has that same um, feathery look and it's right in here so we're going to jump back to that which on the other one are we picking up this back foot at all? Like right over here. Can you see that? I can see on the, the piece that you turn around and touch with your finger. Okay, so this area here is going to wind up being this area, you know, as you move towards the uh, pinky toe. There's the crustacean type look up here, and then as you move towards this area, it's got like that tail, again, to the... Oh, it doesn't matter, we're, we're just going to move on, but... And then, of course, down in this area, there's something weird going on that we're also going to address. But it's like there's more um, just strange tendrils that are there. We've got to watch how deep we cut, though, because before I actually had to add a little bit of clay because we were so close to the to the plaster. So I don't want to take too much off of that again because then we're just back to where we were. So at this point we're going to just refine in here. That's just um, more or less detailing textures and stuff that we're going to add. <clears throat> Again, we don't want to dig too much. We want to keep that fairly thick to allow for the shrink that we're going to have when that's cast in latex. we have a couple of things going on with this. It juts in almost like another, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> but it gets to a certain point and it tapers. So after having played with that design a couple of times on the other side, I'm just going to mask it mirror it over. Once we have that, then we have to figure proportionally how long we need to make that one section. 
So from there to there, we're about right on. This is our little hollow area. So we're going to take our tool and we're going to gouge down in there. See how far we have before we hit material. So I'm basically going to use my knife tool. I'm going to push in. And we're really too close. So I'm going to leave this clay and actually go this section out. That way we're going to have enough room in there that we're not going to be too tight a fit when we cast this in latex. So given the fact that there is so much of a skirt here forward, we'll just build this out by about the same amount that we would have to dig into the other side. Kind of like that, and we're going to fake it. That way we don't touch the depth on that one side. One thing we're also going to do is in this section, rather than go deeper, we're going to add material here. And we're going to add some depth or the illusion of depth. material thickness and we're staying away from that original plaster because we still need to fit that foot back in you know that shoe in real life into the latex so again all these little forms under here we're going to have to add back in and we're projecting that out that there's a taper once it gets to a certain point so we're going to build everything down to that taper point and again it doesn't have to be identical it just has to be close enough does make it interesting all those little forms in there is we're just taking down some of those ridges because he has this kind of loose um, I don't even know how to describe them there's so much going on with this sculpt but these loose kind of um, a villa or I don't know but it's almost 
almost like the same things he has going on in his gills, they're just on his feet. So we're going to add these in here. It's not quite a fin, but there's something going on there. And what we're going to do is chamfer those edges. So by the time we come down with this tool and round them out like they were in the original suit, that they look appropriate. of this one, so we're just going to make it up as close as we can using the other one as reference. of them. They get shorter and longer and like I said, there's a lot going on with those. Forms all in, a little bit more refinement, and then texturing should take care of the rest of what's left. Okay, now we're pretty much at the end. Um, we've got two other little things to do. We've got this bony ridge here and this more fish-like area. So we'll concentrate on the bony area first. We just have to build up those subforms a little bit more. So we see that one starts at the base of the toe, right about here, but we need the thickness on that. So I'm going to take a little bit more and just build up that edge. And that should just about be touching the red in order to maintain our symmetry from the other side. second one that's going to come in about here. So cut 
that in. We're just going to bring that line continuing down because all of these have like a downward slope towards the one before it, depending on how you're looking at it. shaping in there. Kind of like that. We need a little bit more clay right at this joint. It's more like that's fused or joined on the pinky toe there. to the next one. This one is much flatter. And again, that's all sweeping forward. they did what they did in the design, but it's pretty, at least. And this one tucks under. I'm going to take this to keep that line a little bit more defined. blending. We want that nice edge of all those subforms in there. do the same thing we did on the fins up top, only we're going to do it with this tool. However, we need to uh, kind of just get our, our ballpark, how this is going to flow. 
because we want it to look similar. Um, we see that this area and the end of this bony area are kind of connected. Not sure how that is or what it does, but as we're doing our, our lines, we're going to sweep towards the front. And again, these are going to get covered, but this is just an idea for us as we're cutting those lines in there, what pattern we're going to follow. It seems that it comes like with this bone here, it doesn't quite go all the way up to the top of that uh, bony area, but it does come down at an angle sweeping forward like this. These are much more free form. So we're going to scratch in our guide before we start doing anything. And then we're going to take our tool. And again, this doesn't have to be so precise because these just need to look like those little hairy cut type fins, almost like what you would see on a, oh I don't know, kind of like the um, betta fish. How they have much more kind of flowy hairy tails rather than a, a set tail. clean out the tool pretty much every pass because it gets stuck in there. Start tapering that lower and then right at the end we're going to go back up and kind of join that that toe bone there. Very lightly going in. And further adding some striation. At this point I do not want to use that brush on it, the chip brush, because all these fine little pieces are going to get stuck together and undo what I just did. So this is one of those situations where you want to cool the area down first. Once that's nice and cool, then you can brush it. And it's much less likely that it's going to stick. To your art. So it's, I mean, it's cold, much colder than the surrounding. So you see how that kind of cleans it up. Now, since it's getting late, I think we are probably going to have to do one more session just with surface texture and detailing and filling in under these toes. So we're going to have to call this for now. I was hoping we could get it done in this final segment, but um, as it turns out, it's not going to be the final segment because we probably have another 45 minutes or so in just detailing and cleaning up under the toes. So that's where we are before the texture. We've got to remember his little warts too. Uh, but that's where we are before the final texture. But all of the detail is sculpted in and and as you can see, we're pretty darn close to being finished with this leg of the adventure. We just got a little bit more texture, which again, we'll do that when we come back. It'll probably take an hour or so, 45 minutes to an hour. We'll get the final texture, the little wrinkles here, and uh, under the toe. So we should be good. Um, let's check back here. Um, I'll, I'll probably have to just post it because I'm not sure what time it'll be tonight. But uh, if not tonight, we'll have to jump on it tomorrow. But check back to our channel 
And if you have any questions in the meantime, you know how to reach us. Thank you, guys.